Oh, good evening. It's it, thanks so much for being here, and thanks uh, for having me. It's it is fun. Uh, as I recall, when we had lunch with you and Philippa in Denver those years ago, you were just starting to dream what is now the Everything Conference. So it's so uh, wonderful to see that uh, coming to fruition and um, blessing many. Um, hi, thanks so much for coming out tonight. Um, I'm so glad David didn't give you a title because I totally changed the title of what I want to think about. I have two titles. I have two titles. The first title is Looking for Joy in All the Wrong Places. The second title is An Augustinian Guide to Our Anxieties. So let, let me set up what I want to think about with you tonight. Um, here's three words to hang on to, okay, to keep tracking. Because I'm a philosopher, and I am going to ask us to put our thinking caps on tonight. But I want us to dive deep in some theological reflection for the sake of our spiritual lives. Okay? Sometimes the best things we can do for our spiritual lives is to think theologically. Okay? Three words that I'm going to weave together. Joy, rest, anxiety. <laughs> Those are the three threads that we want to try to trace. And here's what I'm proposing. The antithesis of joy is not sadness, but anxiousness. The antithesis of joy is not sadness, it's anxiety. And this, I want to suggest, to think through that theologically might explain something profoundly disordered about our age and the world in which we live and inhabit. Now, our anxieties, I don't think we can say are just tied to like terrible material conditions because in fact, there are all kinds of us who have all of our felt comfort needs taken care of. In fact, there are some of us who not only enjoy a baseline of material comfort, but actually of material wealth. And we are as anxious or more anxious than anyone. So what I'm interested in is what, what, how can we make sense of the ways that anxiety is an inhibitor and stealer, not stealer, that's not a word, a theft of joy. The way that anxiety robs us of joy and therefore robs us of something fundamentally human. And I want to suggest that this is because there's something going on in our cultural moment, our cultural age, that uh, um, has disordered the way we see ourselves and the way we relate to one another. But I, I, I wonder, does this resonate with you that we live in an anxious age? Does that sound like a plausible reading of where we find ourselves? I think a lot of us, I think especially there's probably generational realities about this, and I think that uh, uh, younger people maybe especially feel this intensely in ways that old people like me uh, do not. So when I listen to, uh, uh, when I look at different cultural phenomena, I can see this manifesting itself in a way. To give you one example, do you, do you, do you listen to Arcade Fire on this side of the pond? The band Arcade Fire? Some people do. There's this, so on the last album by Arcade Fire, there's this really, really interesting, which, by the way, is a very theologically interesting album. Um, but there's a song on the last Arcade Fire album called Creature Comfort, which I encourage you to listen to when you get a chance afterwards. Not right now. But after, because it really is, it documents the despair and anxiety that seems to have beset a culture that's characterized by what the philosopher Charles Taylor calls mutual display. Now, I want to hang with that for a second. So Charles Taylor says, one of the things that characterizes a secular age, the age in which we find ourselves, it's an age that's governed by mutual display, where what that means is we are all sort of broadcasting identities to one another. We are, we are living to be seen, and we are living with the anxiety of how we are being seen in a newly intense way. And this Creature Comfort song by uh, um, R.K. Fire is actually kind of heartbreaking in the way they recount this because it's, it's documenting the despairs and anxiety of a society in which we are valued, we feel valued, just to the extent that we are seen by others as worth seeing. 
And when we don't experience that, when we don't feel that we are being seen as worth seeing, the bottom drops out of our identities, of our lives, of our sense of security, of being known and valued. And the, the opening stanza of the song opens this way. Some boys hate themselves, spending their lives resenting their fathers. Some girls hate their bodies, stand in the mirror and wait for the feedback, saying, God, make me famous. If you can't, just make it painless. And the song goes on to recount the way that this prison of self-consciousness, where we're looking for people to see us and value us in a way, when we can't achieve that, it leads to literally suicidal despair and anxiety and depression because we don't know if we are worth living. These are symptoms, but the question is, what's the pathology of this? What's the source of that kind of anxiety and unhappiness? And in that case, it becomes interesting that the refrain of the song over and over and over again attests to now this ambigu ambiguity of a desire because it says, I don't know what I want, I don't know if I want it. I don't know what I want. I don't know if I want it. Part of the uh, restlessness and anxiety of our age is we are unsettled because we don't, we're not even sure what we're looking for when we want this attention. So I don't think it helps to dismiss, have you ever used, heard people use the phrase affluenza as a way of, I think it's a terribly dismissive way of undercutting what is the real felt anxiety and depression of generations that inhabit this world. I don't think that helps us at all to make sense of it. Instead, I want to I want to propose a theological diagnosis of this situation. And I want to offer what might first seem like a scandalous diagnosis of this heightened sense of anxiety that robs us of joy, because I want to argue and be patient with me. I want to argue that idolatry is a way to understand this. That we can think about what's going on in this under the rubric of idolatry. Now, I know, I know what you're thinking. Wait a second. Are you not blaming the victim here? <laughs> like this is, it's sort of like saying, Ashley, I know you're really sad that not everybody liked all of your Instagram posts, but why don't you stop bending the knee to bail for a few moments and maybe you'll... I, that's, not, that's not what I mean at all. I, this is not... When I say that I want to think about these realities and dynamics through the lens of idolatry, really what I mean is I, want, I think we need to think about this through the lens of worship. And we have to understand that actually the, the di only diagnosis that makes sense of the depths of this anxiety is if we think about it theologically as a manifestation of, a disordered manifestation of the fact that we are creatures who are made to worship. So I want to tease that out tonight. Our worship shapes our wants, and our wants find expression in our worship. So could it be that one of the inhibitors of joy in our secular age, this anxious age of mutual display, is a kind of idolatry? Now, I, I really want, I hope this is getting through. I'm not trying to I'm not invoking idolatry as a denunciation. I'm not up here to wag fingers at people and say, you idolaters, you know, there's, this is not a fire and brimstone denunciation. Instead, it's thinking about idolatry as a diagnosis. This isn't denunciation, it's a diagnostic. And you have to remember, our idolatries are not conscious decisions to believe something false, they are more like learned dispositions to hope in things that will disappoint us. Do you see the difference? I, I, this is what I want to unpack. Our idolatries are less about false belief and more about misplaced hopes. So we practice our way into our idolatries. Our idolatries, you might say, are caught more than they are taught. And we, we practice our way into them. They're sort of absorbed from the water that we swim in. So our idolatries actually reflect the ethos of the environments that we live in. That's why this isn't a denunciation of those who are anxious, who've been robbed of joy by the society of mutual display. It's a critique of the world, the environment that we've made, that we've created, that induces that kind of anxiety. So 
To name idolatry as this theft of joy is not to wag our finger at people in judgment, but to specify the real spiritual nature of the challenge that we're up against here. To recognize that the cultural phenomenon that we're grappling with, I think, can only be a properly assessed and addressed with a theological analysis and response. Indeed, I think this is exactly why ministry and mission matters in this context. I, I, I want to suggest that the gospel tackles this challenge on the register of the heart and its devotions, and it offers us a way to find ourselves being seen that is radically different from being seen by all of your friends on Facebook, right? That, that, that's really what we're talking about in the gospel is a radically different account of being seen and being known by a one who gave himself up for us and knows us in that way. So this is why um, I want to suggest, and, and uh, this isn't only because I have a new book on Augustine coming out on Tuesday, but On the Road with St. Augustine comes out on Tuesday. Uh, um, what I want to suggest is I want to go back to St. Augustine, who, for those of you who might not be familiar, is a North African giant of church history who lived in the late 300s and early 400s, is one of the most enduring intellects of the West, and I want to argue helps us in the 21st century to make sense of the phenomenon of anxiety that we are experiencing right now. How does he do that? Well, think of it this way. For Augustine, and let's say for the Bible, <laughs> there is an intimate connection between joy and the good life. Okay, these two, what, what does it mean to live the good life for Augustine? It means to actually find a life of joy. But, one of the markers, one of the distinguishing markers of the happy life found in God is a joy and delight that you could not achieve otherwise. And in fact, the word he will often use to describe that kind of experience of joy is, third word, rest. And I want us to dwell with this. I want us to, I want us to think about tonight the extent to which one of the deepest human hungers and longings is actually to find rest from all our frantic pursuits that make us so anxious. And when you go back to St. Augustine, you hear him saying that what is extended to us from God in Christ is actually the joy that is experienced as rest. It's a contentment that stems from being found. The absence of joy is what Augustine called, the word that August, literal word that Augustine uses to describe the absence of joy is restlessness or inquietude, or it could also be translated anxiety. It's this, the, the opposite of joy is this fr frantic, frenetic, chasing, uh, besetting anxiety that unsettles us constantly. And it's a symptom that one has not achieved the good life. One has not achieved the happy life. One has not been found to have found rest. So Augustine, in many ways, I, I want to suggest is kind of a theologian of joy. And it, I don't know how often we think about the gospel as extending the great human hope of finding joyful rest. But you could do worse for thinking about what is at the heart of the gospel is the gracious good news that humans can finally find rest. The authentic happy life, Augustine says at the end of his famous confessions, is to set one's joy on you, grounded in you, caused by you. That is the real thing and there is no other, he says. Now, Augustine's account of joy in the happy life provides then, I think, this framework to understand some of the existential dynamics of idolatry because he braids together joy, love, and worship. So you have to appreciate there's this interdependence of love, worship, and joy, which is then precisely what goes askew and awry 
when in our disordered worship, in our idolatries, when we are looking for joy in all the wrong places, when we are chasing the wrong things in the wrong way. So think of it this way. Like Bruce Springsteen, happy birthday, Bruce. I think he turned 70 yesterday. Uh, um, like Bruce Springsteen, Augustine thinks everybody's got a hungry heart, right? Every single human being has got a hungry heart. We are chasing something. We are after something. We are longing for something. But what we crave, one way to understand what we crave, Augustine says, is it's rest. At the very opening of his confessions, how many have heard of Augustine's confessions before? Okay, the rest of you run out tonight to Waterstones. But what, what Augustine says is, the very opening paragraph of the confessions, very, probably one of his most famous lines, you have made us for yourself and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. You have made it, this is a claim about all human beings. You have made us for yourself and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. That's the very opening of his confessions. Interestingly, at the very end of his confessions in book 13, here's how he puts it. Lord God, grant us peace for you have given us all things, the peace of quietness, the peace of Sabbath, of rest. Do you see the bookends are a quest for rest, for Sabbath. And I wonder, I, this is, I, I'm giving away some of what's to come, but what, I'm, what I want you to hear in this is the good news of the gospel is that you don't have to perform. You don't have to prove. You don't have to show off. The good news of the gospel is you get to rest. The soul's hunger for Augustine, for peace, is a longing for a kind of rest from all of that anxiety and frantic pursuit to rest in God. And the name he gives to that rest is joy. That's what it means to find peace at last. For Augustine, joy is characterized by this kind of quietude, this placid contentment that's the very opposite of anxiety. It's like, it's like the exhale of someone who's been holding her breath out of fear or worry and insecurity. And there's this, I can sit here. It's the blissful rest of someone who realizes they no longer have to perform because they are loved. And that love is not contingent on their performance. We find joy in the grace of God precisely because he's the one we don't have to prove anything to. That's the heart of the gospel for Augustine. Now, what's interesting here, how are we doing so far? Are you with me? Okay, I know you had a long work day. I, I want to introduce two more Augustinian concepts and then we're going to put it to work, all right? I don't know how am I doing. Deanna's the test for how I'm doing this, okay? So, what, another sort of conceptual framework, and by the way, I think this does work in your life. Once you understand this, you can use this to do some of your own spiritual self-examination. For Augustine, the phenomenon of human desire is he considers it from a different angle. And he says, look at, think of it this way. The human heart can't not love something ultimate. The human heart is made in such a way that it can't not love something ultimate. This is kind of U2's entire discography, but I'm dating myself, okay? So... To be a human is to be a lover. And to be a lover is to look to something as ultimate as the source and end of the happy life. And so Augustine articulates that when you look to something to love it as ultimate, what you're actually looking for is enjoyment. So what you love is what you enjoy insofar as, now this is key, you are looking to it for ultimate satisfaction. That's what you are looking to for ultimate satisfaction. Enjoyment, he says, is clinging to something lovingly for its own sake. I, I grab onto something because I say, it's not a microphone, but I, I, I cling to this in love, in passion, in devotion, because I think this is what will ultimately fulfill me. That's love for Augustine. And every human being does that with something. What you love is what you look to for joy, for ultimate satisfaction that gives you rest from your striving. But here's where Augustine introduced a really crucial distinction. Not everything we try to enjoy 
can actually yield lasting joy. Do you understand what I'm saying? In other words, what Augustine is saying is, okay, I'm going to go Pentecostal here for a second. The altars are open. Uh, what, what Augustine is saying is, um, if I'm human, I can't not actually have a heart that's hungry and looking to love something. And when I love it, ultimately, what I mean is it's going to return ultimate joy. I think this is where I'm going to find it. This is the it that finally helps me achieve the peace that I've been questing for. But, but Augustine points out, he says, here's the thing, though. There aren't many things that can withstand that level of expectation. There are not many things that you can grab hold of and hold on to as your ultimate hope and joy and rest without them actually spilling through your fingers and melting away and disappointing you. So for Augustine, he points out that not everything deserves to be loved in that ultimate way, precisely because not just anything can satisfy our ultimate hungers. And so he articulates what he calls the right order of love. Every human being loves, but here's the trick. You need to love well. You need to love the right things in the right way. And what that means is, as creatures who have infinite hungers and desires and longings, what you need to do is you need to find something infinite to love. So, the right order of love is entrusting our hopes and loves and hungers to something that can withstand how much we are looking for from it. But not everything deserves to be loved in that way because not everything can stand up to the infinity of our longings. We, are, we, we have hungry hearts that are voracious because what they actually want is transcendence, infinitude, plenitude, eternity. We have eternity in our hearts, and that's what we are looking for. Indeed, and now here's the trick. Nothing created can bear the weight of our love like that. No created thing could ever withstand. Not even all the million good things that are created can answer to that infinite hunger and love. And what will happen is, in disordered love, which is disordered worship, which is idolatry, what happens is, now I glob onto this created thing and I'm asking it to give me everything. But it can't possibly. It can never stand up to that. It can never return that to me. It's not infinite. And it's going to pass away. It won't be forever. It won't be as long as my soul. So, um... Uh, um all of creation instead, Augustine says, is, can be received as a gift when we receive it as a gift that precisely points us to the one, huh, I wonder what could I love that would stand up to an infinite desire? Is there anything that could be loved eternally? Yes. <laughs> the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who's given to us in this second person, who we meet in Jesus, there is the one thing in the entire cosmos that is never going to pass away, that will never fail, and that actually meets the measure of our infinite hungers and desires. Make sense? Okay, now, how could this help us think about the way our anxious age is robbing us of joy? And why then might idolatry, disordered love, disordered expectation, might that explain something about why we are so anxious? Well, for Augustine, joy is the rest that is found when we devote ourselves to the one who, for the joy who was set before him, gave himself for us. And we find joy when we look for satisfaction of our hungers in that triune God. So how could this help us understand idolatry? Well, first, notice uh, and this is important, well, it's all important, but th this is important. Idolatry, as we're explaining, as we're using it here as a diagnostic, 
isn't just a problem of false worship. It's not, it's not just a problem on the register of truth. And it's not just that it's a transgression of a commandment. Existentially, the problem with idolatry is that it is an exercise in futility. That's what's wrong with idolatry. The problem with idolatry is it doesn't work. Because what happens is it's a penchant that always will end in profound dissatisfaction and disappointment and unhappiness. It's, and that's what creates restless hearts. This isn't working. Now, one of the things that we will do is when our gods fail us, so to speak, we'll try another right? So, oh, I thought power was going to do it. I thought wealth was going to do it. I thought sex was going to do it. I thought achievement was going to do it. I thought stuff was going to do it. You can, there's a lot, you can go a long time trying a lot of different created things to try to f satisfy your infinite longing for a creator. You, you, can, you can flit around for a long, long time. Augustine's point is Anytime you glom onto some created thing with an infinite longing, it can't sustain it. Now, and friends, I th especially because I think many of us already identify as followers of Jesus, it's very important to realize believers are not prone, are not immune to this. Okay? It's not like you get baptized and all of a sudden you are no longer tempted by such idol idolatry. I could wish... And one of the beautiful things about St. Augustine, by the way, is in book 10 of his confessions, when he's narrating his own life as a bishop, is he confesses all his idolatries. He confesses all the things that he's still tempted to look to to give him ultimate happiness here on earth. So let's not pretend that believers are immune to such idolatries. This is a constant temptation of the Christian life as well, because we still swim in the same water. So... The second thing I'll say is, is about this is Augustine provides a diagnosis of, what's just, of just what's going on in idolatry. He would say we are enjoying what we are supposed to be using. We are treating as ultimate what is only penultimate. We are heaping infinite, immortal expectation on created things that are going to pass away. We are, we are, we are settling on some aspect of the creation rather than being referred to it, through it, to the creator. And in some places, Augustine uses the metaphor of a journey for this. He says, this is a bit like saying, uh, you buy a ticket to get on a boat to get to the beauty of the other shore and you fall in love with the boat. You think, this is a great boat. I love this boat. There's a casino on this boat. Do you know what I mean? Like you're, you, the whole point was to get to the other beautiful distant shore, but the boat has all kinds of entertainments and things. And so you start thinking, you know what? I, I could be pretty happy on this boat. The boat's not going to last forever, and it's going to get claustrophobic. And all the other people on the boat are really going to start grating on your nerves. And eventually, the menu that keeps coming around every two weeks, you're like, I got to eat something. All, all, all that is to say, we, I think we know something about that experience of imagining that we could settle for the happiness of the journey until you realize that the road is exhausting. So we need to recognize that these disordered loves are sort of carried in the water and we can unwittingly practice our way into them. So, okay, let me, I'm talking too long. How does this help us understand our anxious age? The Augustinian, and, and let, let, me, let me hang especially with, let me focus, I don't, I don't want to pick on something, I just want to pick a concrete phenomenon. Let's think a little bit about how this society of mutual display, which is many ways I think embodied for us and amplified for us in the reality of social media. Let's just pick one example. How might this understand, help us understand some of the particular joy-robbing anxieties of our age? Could this framework perhaps help us to understand the way social media affects us? Well, how would we think about it? Here, here's what I would suggest. The Augustinian question to ask here is this. What do I want when I want attention? What do I want when I want attention? What am I looking for? What am I hoping for? What am I longing for? When our hopes 
and our ambition in a way settle, as it, way, as it were, for attention, when we imagine that our whole goal in life is to be noticed, we are actually lowering our sights. Do you see how we're settling? And we are aiming low. And the arc of our ambition now is hugging the earth. And we expect to find fulfillment from people looking at us, from beating everybody else in this competition for attention. But what happens when their attention turns away? And it will. We all know how fleeting attention is. How many likes is enough? How many followers will make me feel valued? What if we're wired not to be liked in that way, but to be loved? And what if we're wired to be loved not by many, but by one? If idolatry is a joy inhibitor that generates anxiety and restlessness, robbing young people of joy that attends the rest we find in a gracious God, then I want to suggest only a theological response is going to be adequate. What would it look like to invite our anxious neighbors into alternative liturgies that might retrain their loves, their hopes, and wants? What, what if the path to joy was giving ourselves over to a God who gives himself for us. What if joy takes practice? Interesting, I, I, um, on that same album, the Arcade Fire album, Every, Everything Now, it opens with that, the despair and malaise of that first song, Creature Comfort. Later, on a later track, the track is called Good God. And there's the despair all of a sudden now you can hear is starting to be haunted by another possibility because the first refrain, and you'll have to forgive me, the first refrain sounds like cursing. In the first refrain, what the, what the narrator of the song is saying is, is there a good God? No, God damn. But by the time you get to the end of the song, the narrator is musing and he says, what if there's a good God? In other words, that would change everything. What if there is a good God? Damn. And then it says, maybe there's a good God. Damn. And the next line, if he made you. If he made you. Imagine if that were true. What game changer would that be? What if we will find hope and rest and joy in being reminded that we are made and that the one who loves us doesn't require a performance? To aspire to friendship with God is an ambition for something you could never lose. To, it is to get attention from someone who sees you and knows you and will never stop loving you. It's the opposite. It's the exact opposite of fickle human attention, which is so temporal and temperamental. God's attention is not predicated on your performance. You don't have to catch God's notice with your display. In fact, God's attention is a place where you can find rest. And in one of his sermons, Augustine says, this is like crawling into your father's lap. You don't have to be worried about getting attention from anyone else. You can rest. You are seen by the one who made you. Thanks very much.